The history of modern psychiatry began in the 18th century. Many thinkers of the Enlightenment criticized the treatment of the mad as inhumane and barbaric. Among these critics was the French physician Philippe Pinel, who would later be known as the father of psychiatry and the liberator of the mad. In the short film Stairway to Light, we see Philippe Pinel descending into a dungeon where the mad are held in captivity under inhumane conditions. In the dark caves below La Bicetre, an iron door opened, letting the sunlight blind the eyes of those below who lived in perpetual night. Slowly then, the new superintendent made his way down the stone stairway. In all the long years of his life, Pinel would never forget the nightmare of that first inspection. Captain George Gaspar, maniac, 35 years in this cell. The year was 1795. The French Revolution had just liberated the people of France from tyranny. Now Pinel was about to free the mad and bring them to a new institution where they would be treated as real human beings. Psychiatry. We can see him freeing the prisoners and spreading his humanitarian message throughout the civilized world. There is a new place for the mad where they can be healed. The movie was inspired by this famous painting by Robert Fleury. It shows Pinel at the renowned hospital Salpetriere ordering the removal of chains from incarcerated patients. The liberated lie at his feet, forever indebted to him. Stairway to Light won an Oscar in 1946, just a short time after the Nazis had killed hundreds of thousands of psychiatric patients they deemed unworthy of life. The movie Stairway to Light presented a fake history of psychiatry to establish a distance between the Nazi atrocities and what was seen as the original humanitarian ethos of psychiatry, embodied in the most famous of its founders, Philippe Pinel. But in this noble effort, the movie wrongly portrays 19th century psychiatry as a place of liberation for the mentally ill. This video will present a different history of psychiatry, one that is not solely based on the idea of linear progress. Psychiatric knowledge served different purposes at different times, and it underwent paradigm shifts that redefined the meaning of madness, therapy and cure. In the 18th century, the mad was primarily the one who erred. The distinguishing feature of this error was that it could not be clarified through logical reasoning. In the case of madness, the error had to be resolved through different techniques. Some doctors used sudden and loud noises or extreme heat to wake the mad from their delirium. Others tried to bring relief to their patients with early forms of brain surgery. One of the more humane treatments involved traveling, relaxation and long walks in nature. It was believed that nature, as the visible and most original form of reality, could disperse the false belief. Another interesting procedure could be called healing through deception. A theater was performed for the patient. First, an alternative reality was created that matched the false beliefs of the mad person. Now, there was no madness anymore, since the belief of the insane matched reality. In the second step, the ordinary reality was re-established. Let's look at a case study from this era. A man was convinced that his housekeeper was part of a conspiracy and wanted to poison him. No argument could convince him of his hallucinations. This person's friends then worked with a doctor and a judge to create a reality that matched this insane belief. They called some inaugurated experts who would find poison on the man's shirt. This evidence convicted the housekeeper and the judge sentenced her to imprisonment in a staged trial. The doctor then prescribed some antidotes and after the whole performance was over, it is said, the man regained his sanity. Beginning with the 16th century, more and more people who were considered insane were incarcerated. And, according to legend, the first psychiatrists, or alienists as they were then called, freed them and used their medical knowledge to cure them. Proto-psychiatry of the early 19th century abandoned most of the pre-psychiatric methods. While madness was still defined as a special kind of error, 
Therapeutic practices changed and were now based on complete subjugation. Madness was now seen as a revolt of power. Pinel, the great liberator, described his so-called moral treatment of madness as the art of subjugating and taming the lunatic by making him strictly dependent on a man who by his physical and moral qualities is able to exercise an irresistible influence on him and alter the vicious chains of his ideas. According to protopsychiatric knowledge, the prototype of all mental illness was the belief in being a king. Every mad person thinks in some way that he is a sovereign and wants everyone to accept his truth. He tries to dictate his wicked reality to everyone around him, even the doctors. The psychiatrist had to break his will to free him from his madness. In this battle of wills, the psychiatrist used techniques like isolation, torture, humiliation, physical punishment, harsh diets, interrogations or pharmaceuticals. He did not create a reality that matched the false beliefs of the patient, as doctors have suggested before. Instead, he enforced reality to break the will of the patient. The French alienist François Luré assumed that there is a will to be insane and that, in a perverse way, the mad take pleasure in their madness. The task of the psychiatrist was to make their madness unpleasurable. At this stage, psychiatry was disconnected from modern medicine. Physiologists invented new medical devices for curing the mad, but psychiatrists would use them as torture devices instead. Here is an example that Michel Foucault picked out for one of his lectures. In a work consecrated to the moral treatment of madness and published in 1840, a French psychiatrist, Luré, tells of the manner in which he treated one of his patients. Treated and, of course, as you may imagine, cured. One morning he placed Mr. A, his patient, in a shower room. He makes him recount in detail his delirium. But all that said the doctor, is nothing but madness. Promise me not to believe in it any more. The patient hesitates, then promises. That is not enough, replies the doctor. You have already made me similar promises and you haven't kept them. And he turns on the cold shower above the patient's head. Yes, yes, I am mad, the patient cries. The shower is turned off. The interrogation is resumed. Yes, I recognize that I am mad, the patient repeats. But, he adds, I recognize it because you are forcing me to do so. Another shower. Well, well, says Mr. A. I admit it. I am mad, and all that was nothing but madness. The psychiatrists did not use these painful showers to cool inflamed brains, as the physiologist suggested, but as torture devices. Nonetheless, protopsychiatrists used to have medical degrees. These degrees served as a source of authority and a guarantee that psychiatric medicine was grounded in science. In other words, the psychiatrists of protopsychiatry did not use psychiatric knowledge to find therapeutic practices but to improve their power level and justify their power over others. They believed that this power would transform mental patients into normal citizens. Let's look at a more detailed example of protopsychiatric practice. The treatment is that of Monsieur Dupré and is reported in the final chapter of the Traitement Moral de la Folie written by François Luré in 1840. When Monsieur Dupré entered the asylum, he showed many signs of madness. Among them was the belief that he was many persons at the same time and also King Napoleon. Monsieur Dupré also believed that Paris was actually the city of Langres, disguised as Paris. Furthermore, every person around him, including the psychiatrist, was female, while he was the only man. The psychiatrist tried to establish an imbalance of power right from the beginning. In their first meeting, he accused Dupré of laziness, vanity and untruthfulness, and required him to stand upright and bareheaded before him. What followed was a series of demonstrations of power. The psychiatrist demonstrated his physical strength by attacking him, asking if a woman could overpower him that easily. He deliberately gave him poisoned food that caused diarrhea and mentioned the next day to Dupré that his diarrhea must be a sign of fear. 
He tortured him in the shower until he admitted that he was not the only male in the room. Then there were other techniques to make him obey reality. He forced Dupré to talk about his past, to speak Italian, which he learned in the army, to write down his biography, to address the doctor as his supervisor, and he traveled with him to the city of Paris to witness its reality. Psychiatry was a very young institution and psychiatric knowledge was not yet established as a science. Consequently, the status of the psychiatrist as a doctor has been questioned. But at the same time, he could decide on the freedom of individuals and exercise unrestrained power over them. And, as we've already witnessed, once a person became a psychiatric patient, the alleged medical knowledge of the psychiatrist was translated into psychiatric power. To legitimize that power, he had to constantly re-establish his medical authority. And since he could not point to organic causes or the application of medical knowledge inside the asylum, the only way to do so was by making accurate diagnoses. But this was more complicated than in medicine. Pathological anatomy, which emerged at the end of the 18th century, led to a paradigm shift in medicine. It allowed the doctor to localize the disease in a lesion within the body of the patient and perform a differential diagnosis. As early as the 19th century, psychiatrists were also looking for connections between organs and mental illnesses, yet it was only found in rare cases, such as syphilis. Due to this difference, the practice of diagnosis in the asylum was quite different. The central question of protopsychiatry was not whether a particular form of madness was due to an organic lesion, but whether or not a form of behavior of speaking or hallucinating belonged to madness. For the diagnosis, the protopsychiatrist had three techniques available. Interrogation, drugs and hypnosis. The first technique included a search for medical illnesses of ancestors and relatives, as well as anomalies in the biography. Since the body was absent in protopsychiatry, the psychiatrist could only use the patient's life as a tissue of pathological symptoms. What the psychiatrist needed to hear was something like, An uncle of mine committed suicide. I once crucified a frog as a child. Yes, I hear voices. I hallucinate. I think I am Napoleon. The second technique involved the usage of drugs. Inside the asylum, psychiatrists mainly used them as sedatives, but in the case of diagnosis, drugs had two more functions. They were said to enforce madness, to create what pre-modern medicine called a crisis, and they were able to grant the psychiatrist knowledge over madness. The French psychiatrist Moreau de Tours wrote a book in 1845 entitled Du hashish et de l'alignation mentale, where he described his experiments with hashish. In his description, all symptoms of madness appear successively, and it is because of these effects that the psychiatrist, who has tried drugs himself, could claim to understand madness. He could claim to have a scientific understanding of madness because he could reproduce and experience it. The third technique was hypnosis, which granted the psychiatrist complete control over the patient and her symptoms. Physiological symptoms, such as muscular paralysis, could be displayed on command. It opened up a new way for the psychiatrist to obtain a real hold on the patient's body. Psychiatrists eventually developed a fourth technique of diagnosis based on neurology, which became part of a new paradigm shift at the end of the 19th century. It was around the 1860s when a new way of looking at the human body emerged with neurology. For 19th century anatomy, the body mainly consisted of parts like organs and tissues. But the neurological body would also encompass functions and behaviors. The stimulus-response scheme and the study of reflexes and synergies emerged from neurology. The survey of reflexes allowed the neurologists to differentiate between automatic and voluntary responses to a stimulation of the body. For example, neurologists could distinguish between the voluntary mutism of hysterics and aphasia, an inability to speak due to brain damage. 
the neurological analysis used in psychiatry introduced a new way of interrogation. Psychiatrists complemented their questioning by requests that were supposed to cause reactions, such as speak, stretch your leg, read this sentence, and so on. In the case of ordinary questioning, the patient will answer and it is up to her will whether she tells the truth. But now the body's reaction gives the true answer and the neurologist can interpret it. This new technique brought psychiatrists one step closer to treating hysteria as an actual illness. It was possible to place hysteria very close to the domain of neurology by diagnosing not so much the causes but the forms of the symptoms. Neurology eventually freed the hysterical woman from protopsychiatry and it seemed to enable the application of differential diagnosis, the technique of real medicine. As mentioned before, the psychiatrist depended on the patient giving him symptoms to make a medical assessment. And there was one kind of patient, the hysterical woman, who displayed more symptoms than the psychiatrist could have wished for, and more than he could handle. The famous psychiatrist Jean-Martin Charcot claimed that one of his patients had 17,083 hysterical attacks in 14 days. To make sense of these endless performances, the psychiatrist tried to find good symptoms. A good symptom was a symptom that was regular, constant and common among hysterical patients. But to discriminate between symptoms, the psychiatrists had to bring the hysterics to display single symptoms out of the sheer amount of symptoms that came with an attack. This was possible with hypnosis. Once a patient was hypnotized, it was possible to pick out single symptoms through simple commands like, now you cannot move your left hand. But there had to be correlatives outside of hypnosis to make it believable that these artificially induced behaviors were symptoms of a real illness. And it was relatively easy to find patients outside the asylum who displayed exactly the disorders that were observable under hypnosis. Through the emergence of health insurance and new public health measures, psychiatrists could draw on big data. The symptoms that these people displayed were natural in the sense that they occurred outside the hospital and the asylum. The artificially induced symptoms of the hypnotized patients could be compared to the symptoms that appeared in the wild. In this way, one could find out whether symptoms that appeared in the asylum also appeared outside of it. And it was also used the other way around. The insurance companies were interested in exposing insured patients as simulators with the help of psychiatric knowledge. A worker might claim that he cannot move his leg after a traumatic accident, although there is no visible lesion. This worker could be convicted as a simulator by comparing the symptoms that the hypnotized hysterics could display with that of the allegedly traumatized worker. If the paralysis that the worker displayed could not be recreated in a hypnotized patient, he must have simulated a fake symptom. So, in Charcot's theater, it was possible to verify the symptoms of the hysterics by referring to the traumatized workers, and that of the workers by referring to the hysterics. Pinel and other protopsychiatrists freed the hysterics from their former prisons only to make them prisoners of protopsychiatry. Charcot and his colleagues freed the hysterics from protopsychiatry and made them actors in their theater of hysteria. This theater of hysteria consisted of paintings, drawings, photographs, tableaus, wax castings, meticulous descriptions, medical records, biographies and, of course, the endless performances that the hysterical patients gave to satisfy the desires of the psychiatrists. La Salpetriere, the clinic Charcot worked at, was known as hell. In the 1860s, the clinic provided one doctor for 500 patients, 250 patients died a year and only 10% would leave the clinic in a better condition than when they were admitted. Thousands of women were detained at the clinic that Charcot could choose from. Visitors of the clinic reported that some women were eager to perform for Charcot and whenever a symptom that Charcot was interested in disappeared, they were desperate. There have always been doctors who believed that hysteria is not an exclusively female disease and Charcot's attempt to make hysteria a neurological disease would have actually made it a cross-gender disease. But in practice this had little effect. 
the focus was still on the uterus and it was exclusively female patients that Charcot presented to an exclusively male audience. His favorite patient was a young woman named Louise Augustine Glass. She was beautiful, suggestible and her symptoms were interesting and regular. At the age of 13 she was raped by her mother's lover and two years later she was admitted into Salpetriere. Charcot used her for countless performances. Before a performance, Charcot used to inspire a patient by pantomimically implying symptoms. Augustine's condition worsened with every performance and her admiration for Charcot turned into hate. Eventually, she fled the clinic when she was 19 years old, disguised in man's clothes, never to be seen again. In search of the cause of the functional disorders, Charcot developed the concept of trauma, which was established in 1877. According to him, trauma is a state of local and permanent hypnosis that is only focused on one point, such as the ability to walk. To be sure that the behavior of the hysterical woman is pathological, the origin of the trauma had to be found. The search for the origin included questions about one's childhood, which was a significant development. The woman started talking about their sex life, how they witnessed violent sexual acts between adults as a child, how they were taught about sex by other children, how they were raped by their mother's lover and so on. Charcot himself never talked about this, but it was all written down in detail by his studious students. But not just the stories the woman told, but also their attacks involved sexual speech and expression. Foucault gave the following example taken from a note from a student of Charcot. Monsieur Charcot sends for Genevieve, suffering from hysterical spasms. She is on a stretcher. The interns, the senior doctors, have previously hypnotized her. She undergoes her major hysterical attack. Charcot, following his usual technique, shows how hypnosis can not only provoke, induce hysterical phenomena, but can also stop them. He takes his baton, resting it on the patient's belly, precisely on the ovaries, and the attack is in fact suspended. Charcot removes his baton, the attack begins again. Tonic period, clonic period, delirium, and at the moment of delirium, Genevieve cries out, Camille, Camille, kiss me, give me your cock. Professor Charcot has Genevieve taken away. Her delirium continues. Charcot did not talk about these attacks either, not for reasons of morality or prudishness, but because he feared that this would sabotage his endeavor to classify hysteria as an actual illness. He feared it would be too easy a target for critics who claimed that hysterical women were nothing but simulators. In the history of psychiatry, simulation was always seen as one of the greatest threats to the status of psychiatry as a science, as well as the authority of the psychiatrists, since it is the point where the patient is able to gain power over the doctor and dictate reality to him. The Austrian neurologist Sigmund Freud, who had done an internship with Charcot in 1885, remembered his confusion when he overheard Charcot saying in a private conversation that hysteria is obviously a matter of sexuality. But it took a few years for Freud to discover sexuality as his main topic. Charcot's attempt to turn hysteria into a real illness with the help of neurology ultimately failed. But by taking the hysterics out of protopsychiatry and by convincing the woman to perform functional symptoms and talk about their past, Charcot and his colleagues gave rise to something else. A medicine of sexuality. The medicine of sexuality, with its ideas of hygiene, degeneration, race, eugenics, instincts and heredity, and which was quite different from the psychoanalysis of sexuality, opened up a new unpleasant chapter of psychiatry. Some parts of psychiatry were converted and lost their therapeutic function completely. Their purpose was now to protect society from contact with the so-called abnormal and degenerate. The degenerate is a risk to society. Degeneration does not come from the outside, it is a dangerous element that comes from within the own group. The degenerate is someone who cannot be healed or rehabilitated. And eventually, 
psychiatrists will end up allying with Nazis to murder the patients they could not heal. This was the history of protopsychiatry told by Foucault in his lectures from 1973. It was in part constituted as an alternative to the enlightened history of the humanization of therapy. Of course, the whole history of psychiatry cannot be reduced to that. It was only one part of it, and there are many more changes, failures, debates, horrors and success stories to be told. But the history of psychiatry is not one single success story of linear progress in which every decade marks an improvement in an ever more humane treatment. It is important to tell history in such a way that today's state of affairs is not depicted as the end point of a linear progression that occurred sometime in the past.